this day with PBS 39 as we explore the arts on an all new episode of First Fridays on Focus. We introduce you to a local photographer who travels near and far to capture unforgettable images. Learn the stories behind Frank Smith's photographs and his role in an upcoming photo festival. Plus, a concert hall full of marimbas comes to Kutztown University. We join their percussive preparations coming up next on First Fridays on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest Banking Insurance Investments. Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you, thank you. Thank you for joining us, I'm Lara McHugh. In this episode, we focus on the arts, starting with a special event taking place this weekend. The sixth annual Olympus Envision Photo Festival celebrates the works of both professional and amateur photographers. Hosted by the Bethlehem-based organization ArtsQuest, it speaks to anyone who feels at home behind the camera and to those who love to lay eyes on the images they capture. Here with a profile of one of several featured artists is Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo. Brittany. Laura, Lehigh Valley photographer Frank Smith captures eye-catching moments in the blink of an eye. While this award-winning photographer resides in our very own backyard, many of his photos feature his travels from across the world. Frank recently let us tag along on a shoot in Allentown. As autumn falls in the Lehigh Parkway, Frank Smith from Center Valley captures it on camera. I'm not an indoor studio guy. My studio, for the most part, is the outdoors. As the sun begins to set on this October afternoon, Frank scouts scenes for his next shot. The trick is opening your eyes and learning to see the unobvious, and it's amazing how many gems there are right in front of us. A 30-year veteran in the commercial and industrial real estate business, you could say Frank favors photography part-time. Well, my wife would debate that because she uh, says that I may devote sometimes more time to the photography end of the business. <laughs> yes, I definitely would. This is a full, it's a full-time, part-time avocation. He loves it. That's because when Frank's not working in real estate, he travels the globe in search of his next story to tell through photographs. It's always been a passion of mine. I'm a strong believer that if you want to be successful at something, you need to have the passion for it. A passion that started at age three, when Frank's grandfather, a photographer for a New York advertising agency, gave him a replica 35 millimeter camera. He had a real one with real film in it, but uh, of course I didn't know that mine didn't have any film in it. But that didn't last long. Self-taught with the tricks he learned from his grandfather, Today, Frank travels the world primarily as a philanthropic photojournalist. He's worked with several nonprofits around the world, raising awareness on cultural issues. Inside his home studio, Frank shows us photos from his trip to Africa, where he was able to photograph the independence of South Sudan. This is where I had the opportunity to be in the, uh, to see the witness the birth of a nation. And this was a huge day uh, where um, I was allowed into the parade field. There's a general saluting uh, the troops as they're marching by. And I was probably two feet away from him as he's saluting the troops. So I have a silhouette of him with the army in the background. And that's, that's a, an image that stands in my mind from that event. His work combines artistry and adventure showcasing beauty in the most unforeseen places, like this photo from Mumbai, India. She is living outside of what is arguably the largest dump in the world. And uh, after I took that shot, I climbed up that uh, to just to see what was on top. And as far as you could see, it was just trash. In addition to his philanthropic work, 
Frank captures local landscapes like Allentown's Center City and the Lehigh Parkway. He's also traveled internationally to places such as Auschwitz concentration camp in Germany and Cuba. I was very fortunate to be there when uh, President Obama made the announcement that we're going to be opening up diplomatic relations with the United States. I had many people come up to me in the streets and they'd ask me where are you from and I'd say the United States and they'd start hugging and saying we're going to be friends again. In addition to his many awards and accolades, Frank is recognized as an Olympus trailblazer, one of a dozen elite Olympus photographers from across the United States and Canada. He will speak further on his trip to Cuba during the sixth annual Olympus Envision Photo Festival at the Banana Factory and the Arts Quest Center at Steel Stacks in Bethlehem. The goal of the festival is to bring out the Lehigh Valley arts community to uh, enjoy photography even more than ever before. The festival highlights both award-winning and emerging artists to kick off Lehigh Valley Photography Month. And is it an opportunity to give Lehigh Valley photographers, maybe amateur or, or mid-level photographers, an opportunity to experience some great uh, techniques, uh, some great stories, some great advice? To aspiring artists, Frank offers these words of advice. Number one is learn the rules of photography, learn, learn the fundamental rules of photography. Number two, be prepared to break all those rules. Approaching photography the same way he approaches life. A lot of people say, well, you know, I've got a job, so I don't know that I can, you know, do this also. And I would tell them 100% they're incorrect on that, that uh, again, there's balance in, in life. It's what you make of it. And I tell people that uh, if it's a passion of theirs, you know, follow both of those paths. Because perhaps for Frank Smith, photography, like life, is all in the way you see it, the lens you look through. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo, reporting. Thank you, Brittany. To learn more about the Envision Photo Festival, I'm now joined by photographer and the director of art programs at Northampton Community College, Tom Chalet. His work using a specific technique called platinotype is featured in collections, including the George Eastman House, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the National Portrait Gallery, just to name a few. He's a resident artist at the Banana Factory in Bethlehem, where you can see his latest exhibit, Masquerade, at the Santa Bannon Fine Art Gallery. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Well, thank you, Laura, for inviting me to be here today. So before we start talking about your work specifically, mm -hmm. would you tell us about the Envision mm -hmm. Photo Festival? It kicks off sure. uh, November 6th, 7th, mm -hmm. and 8th, and launches what's called Lehigh Valley Photo Month Correct. throughout the month of November. Yes. I think that's what makes the Envision Photo Festival unique in that it's not just a weekend festival, it's a month long, which is a, a, an amazing amount of time to have people or give people an opportunity to see photography. And it involves almost every uh, college, university, and gallery and museum in the Lehigh Valley and actually extending beyond the Lehigh Valley. During that month, they all exhibit photographs by different photographers, for, so people will be inundated with a wonderful, great creative photography in the month of November in the Lehigh Valley because of Envision Photo Festival. It sounds like so many photographers participate. How yes. many have been involved? Oh, well, this, I believe, is the fifth year. And typically, if you count all the galleries and the museums, there are probably 30 or 40 different exhibits each year during the Envision Photo uh, Festival and the Photography Month. So you times that by five, it's been quite like 200, 300 photographers and exhibits in the Lehigh Valley, which is, is phenomenal. And you actually have an exhibit yourself as you usually do. Yes, last year I exhibited at uh, the uh, Allentown Art Museum, not during the festival, but right before it. This year I have an exhibit at the Santa Bannon Fine Art Gallery, which is uh, 26 West 23rd Street, uh, Studio 93 in the Banana Factory. And it's called Masquerade. And it opens um, on the 6th, which is next Friday, which is the opening day for the InVision Photo Festival. And another photographer's work will also be in that exhibit, David Moser. And the title of his exhibit is American Housewife. So there's two very different uh, exhibits in the Santa Bannon Fine Art Gallery. And David and I will be there on the 6th around 7 o'clock to talk about our work. And that's open to the public. Now, your photographs have a very unique appearance. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned, it's a specific technique called mm -hmm. platinotype. Correct. Can you describe that yeah. process for us? 
I will try. It's very complex. Uh, first of all, it's a 19th century photographic process, and I like to think that I have one foot in the 19th century, one foot in the 20th, and another foot in the 21st century in terms of photography, because I've worked basically with materials and cameras and processes that span that amount of time. The platinotype process was invented in 1870 before electricity really was available. So it's a contact printing process, which means you, your negative has to be the same size as your image. So I use a very large 8 by 10 inch view camera, and that's the size of the film that I shoot. So I still shoot black and white film. It's not digital. Okay? There was no digital back in 1870. Right? So I shoot black and white film. It's 8 by 10 inches in size. That's the size of the negative, which I then process. And then I coat my own paper because the uh, platinotype was commercially available up until about 1918. And then it went off the market because platinum is a very expensive metal. It's the most expensive metal in the universe. And that's the metal that forms the image in my photographs. So I have to mix the chemistry by hand using eyedroppers and measuring out certain amounts. And then I pour that on a piece of paper and I brush it on. And I have a print. Uh, here that will show you those brushwork edges. Once that sensitizer, which I've handmade, soaks into the paper, that paper is now light sensitive. So I take my 8x10 negative and I lay it on top of that paper. Okay, It's called a contact printing process. So the negative is in contact with the paper. And then I have to expose it to ultraviolet radiation because back in 1870 they were using sunlight to make their prints. Right? No electricity again. So I can either use the sun or I can use an artificial source, which I usually use, of ultraviolet radiation. That will then expose the negative to the paper, and then I have to develop it in a special chemical, and the image is formed on the paper. And then I have to etch the rest of the metal out of the paper in hydrochloric acid to get rid of any metals left over, and then wash it and dry it. At the end, I wind up with a photograph that's made of platinum metal. And it looks more like a drawing or an engraving or an etching than a photograph, and you'll see that in the examples that I, that I brought along. And you brought your camera to the studio as mm -hmm. well. This mm -hmm. is a vintage camera that it's you shoot. It's over 100 years it. old. Yeah. And so you've had many of your uh, photographs and your work exhibited in galleries mm -hmm. across the country, yeah. including the National Portrait Gallery. Correct. They uh, have some of my photographs in their permanent collection. I've also exhibited there, and I've exhibited at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and other museums and galleries around the country. But I'm most proud of the fact that these museums have my work in their collection because it validates to me the importance of the work. Because I've dedicated my entire life to my, my photography, and one wants to get that sense of achievement and accomplishment at the, at the end of their career. And which are on display at the National Portrait Gallery, which are in their permanent collection? Well, it, it varies. I'll have exhibits uh, throughout the years, and they change. But uh, I have a series of photographs of Credit Scott King, which I made in 1985, and I brought one of those today which we can look at. And then I have some portraits of uh, Sissy Spacek, who is the Academy Award winning actor, uh, Mario Andretti, uh, Malcolm Forbes, and uh, Davis Finney. I also photographed Ronald Reagan in the, in the Oval Office, but um, do not have any of those prints in the uh, National Portrait Gallery because they don't, they have a separate category for presidents, believe it or not. It's a very hierarchical system <laughs> of whose work they want to show and who can get in and who can't get in. So it's kind of interesting. Well, thank you so much oh, for welcome. sharing this sure. information, Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a local artist interested in supersizing your artwork, ArtsQuest and Adams Outdoor Advertising may have a unique opportunity for you. Throughout the year, a program called Art Pop has featured the work of six area artists on billboards along major roadways in the Lehigh Valley. Organizers recently announced that they will continue the project with new billboards in 2016. They will accept submissions from the public through November 16th and open online voting for a People's Choice Award winner, December 8th through the 18th. New this year, an opportunity to feature the artwork of one local high school student. For all the details, visit bananafactory.org. Our next story takes us to Kutztown University, where students have prepared an unusual performance in honor of the school's 150th anniversary. Focus reporter Grover Silcox takes us to Kutztown for this Focus on Campus. Grover? Thank you, Laura. Kutztown University has become a center for mallet percussion and especially for marimba. The school has acquired a collection of marimbas from the estate of legendary marimba player Claire Omar Musser, who hailed from Mannheim, Pennsylvania. In recognition of the university's 150th anniversary, a special concert has been planned called Celebrate Marimba in honor of Musser. 
It will bring the university's percussion students together with other marimba players from across the country into one vast marimba orchestra. If that familiar marimba ringtone gets your attention, imagine what a concert hall full of marimbas might do. In rehearsal for an upcoming concert featuring 120 marimbas, these Kutztown University students practice the works of legendary marimba player, conductor, and teacher, Claire Obar Musser. Who in the 1930s organized some 100-piece marimba orchestras. Last year, Kutztown University acquired Musser's instruments, including his personal King George C to C marimba and a very rare Deegan contrabass. These instruments are in such good shape, the students perform on them. Will Rapp, Professor Emeritus at Kutztown, compares the marimba to the piano. The marimba is a very close relationship to the piano in its structure of the keys. And, and the sound it produces. The bars of the marimba are typically made of rosewood and connect to resonators. The resonator pipes, the, the, the long brass or aluminum tubes that extend downward from each of the bars are really the reason that help to make the sound as full as it is. The bar itself, it, it vibrates in such a way that if you play right in the center of the bar, it creates a different sound than if you move the mouth slightly off center. On this day, Dr. Frank Kumar, a music professor and director of the percussion ensemble at Kutztown, prepares his students for the concert. Marimba players most often come from a drum background and must tackle a whole new set of challenges on the marimba, starting with placement of the mallet. That's hard. I mean, if you think about a snare drum, you have a, very, a snare drum stick with a very small point on it and a 14-inch target. When you come to marimba, the target is maybe two inches wide and your mallet is about an inch and a half. If a player uses more than one mallet in each hand, that increases the challenge. If you think about the shape of your hand, your hand is sort of curved. So you have to adjust the, the way you hold the mallets because the, the keyboard is straight. I think it's almost you know, exponential in its difficulty. You add another mallet, you're, it's like you're going from squaring to cubing. Erin Phillips, a Kutztown senior and music education major, cites another challenge. And you have to be able to do the coordination between looking at the music at the same time as playing without always looking down where you're hitting. Judson Brill, also a senior and music education major, started out as a drummer in kindergarten and began taking marimba in fourth grade. I love playing marimba because it gives us an opportunity to really express the music in a way that we can't when we're sitting behind a drum set. And, at least during this rehearsal, it gave me a chance to get down with the marimba. Of course, it helps to be playing next to the professor. As these students prove, it takes talent, dedication, and practice to make the marimba come to life and to give an audience something to celebrate. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. A choral performance at Lehigh University this weekend honors the 20 children and six adults who were killed during the 2012 shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. I'm now joined by the composer, Lehigh University's Ronald J. Ulrich Professor of Music and Choral Arts Artistic Director, Dr. Stephen Samets. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure. This event for many of us was a flashbulb moment. We can remember where we were when we saw it happen. Um, but you not only watched it, you ended up writing music about it. How did that happen and why did it make such an impact on your life? In 2013, I was the recipient of the Sackler Music Award, which is administered by the University of Connecticut. And I am from Connecticut. And I wanted to write something about Connecticut. And I was raised 20 miles away from Newtown, where the killing had happened. And my upbringing had been a kid that just could go to elementary school. There weren't metal detectors. There wasn't this worry. And I was very affected by this idea that children couldn't do that, that these 20 children had had their lives so abruptly ended by this senseless act of violence. 
So composers frequently respond to what's going on in society, and I decided I would write a piece to memorialize uh, those children's lives and offer some healing if possible. As you were writing, I've read that a very specific image of the children holding hands and being led out of school um, really stuck in your mind. Describe that image for, for, for our viewers and how it was incorporated into your work. Well, I wanted to try to give voice to the peer group most affected at Sandy Hook, which would be the children. So I started the process by asking children for drawings and for their writings in response to tragedy and loss. And it was a very interesting journey because normally composers sequester themselves in their studios and they take their pencils, they scratch on paper, and several months later emerge with perhaps a finished work and everyone gets to hear it. This was a very public process for me. This was having to announce the piece, go out and ask for uh, children's writings, and we ended up getting writings from all across the country. This went national. We connected with Gabby Gifford's um, Hands of Hope in California. And I started compiling drawings and writings and, and uh, poetry from children. One of the earliest ones I got was from a Lehigh Valley uh, seven-year-old named Jess. And it was of two angels holding hands in the sky. And what this told me very, very quickly was that no matter how you ask children to talk about tragedy, they responded positively. They responded with rainbows and clouds and angels. So it's very hard to keep kids negative. Um, so eventually I compiled all of these and they became the libretto for the piece, uh, combined with uh, poetry of Emerson, Dickinson, our local luminary HD. Uh, these adult poets, adult American poets, created an adult world in the piece. And then the children's uh, writings created a children's uh, kind of playground in the piece. And how do these things collide? is really the struggle of the piece. How can we address this issue of when violence happens to children, how do we keep children safe? How have both performers and audiences responded to the piece? The piece was premiered in Connecticut in uh, March of this year, and I think it had a strong impact. People were crying at the end. Uh, but it's not all about despair. Uh, requiems are for the living. This is called a child's requiem, but it's, it's offered to heal, but it, requiems want to give us a way to move forward. And uh, in the traditional requiem settings of the Catholic Mass, this is not a religious piece. Um, it would be an imparadisum setting. But in this case, it was children's words that kind of conclude the requiem with, I, out my window, there's a pathway to the stars. And it's kind of this child's view of how we kind of go to paradise or into these clouds that this picture shows. So the Requiem ends with hope and it ends positively, but there's a long journey from that opening of a child's classroom, which is abruptly uh, interrupted by a sound of a gunshot in the orchestra, and then it moves all the way through this struggle with a, a mother figure in the soprano, the tenor is the father, there's a voice of a child, there's a children's chorus that is used, an adult chorus that is used in an orchestra. All of this culminates in a kind of moving to the beyond at the end and hopefully offers a little bit of a, a ray of sunshine at the end of the Child's Requiem. All right, thank you so much for, for sh sharing this information and for joining us on Focus. My pleasure. The stories covered in this episode came from viewers just like you. To share your story ideas or join the conversation, connect with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube at PBS39 and on Twitter at PBS39 Channel. Grover and Brittany are joining me now. Brittany, that must have been a really fun time at Lehigh Parkway. Yeah, it really was. And you know what's so interesting about these First Friday art shows is that not only do we get to see the art, but we get to be out there and experience it with the artists, which is really interesting. Um, and I did want to mention about Frank, all the profits go to charity. Um, so it's this amazing work that's also benefiting uh, people in our community and beyond. And a little piece of trivia about Brittany Garzillo, she's a little bit of an amateur photographer herself and has had her work exhibited at the Envision Photo Festival. Yes, that was years ago, um, but I looked through many of the photos that are in the college competition and the PA competition and they're beautiful, so we look forward to being at that event this weekend. And Grover, were you really playing the marimbas? 
Uh, I'll never tell, but it was the magic <laughs> of television. And, uh, you know, it has been said about me that uh, Grover Silcox is where rhythm goes to die. <laughs> so I think I kind of proved that there. But it was great to see really good marimba players. Those students are fantastic. And, of course, they're going to be joined by uh, more than 100 other marimba, uh, marimba players from around the country. So it'll be a great concert. I never thought I would say marimba so many times. I know. It mm. actually starts to become <laughs> a very pleasing sound after a while. But it's, it's a really, it's a toe-tapping type of instrument. So I enjoyed it. Thank you, Grover. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Until then, remember to focus on what matters.